21 of Exodus, verses 7 through 11. Let's bow our heads and ask God to open up this text to us now. Father, we delight that you've given us the very word of God so that we might see how you would have us direct all of society in our concerns. Lord, let us find application in the ancient law to the church in infancy. And let us see wisdom in how we might apply it in our own day. In Jesus' name. morning. As Pastor said, Exodus 21. I'll give you a second to turn to that in your Bible. We will be reading verses 7 through 11. If a man sells his daughter as a servant, she is not to go free as men servants do. If she does not please the master who has selected her for himself, he must let her be redeemed. He has no right to sell her to foreigners because he has broken faith with her. If he selects her for his son, he must grant her the rights of a daughter. If he marries another woman, he must not deprive the first one of her food, clothing, and marital rights. If he does not provide her with these three things, she is to go free without any payment of money. You and I are living in a culture that's not quite sure how to treat women. We're living in a culture that is constantly, if you've been watching the news lately, been talking about how should we speak to women, how should we speak about women. And in this, cult, in this culture, a 21st century American reading a 3,500 year old Semitic text about selling your daughter into slavery is liable to have the typical knee-jerk reaction of, you see? You see, the Bible can't be relevant, the Bible can't be ethical, this can't be God's word because it talks about selling your daughter into slavery. And so we need to understand the cultural context of what's going on in the Hebrew culture so in order to better understand it because when you rightly understand this, what you're going to see is God is always about protecting the women in the culture and lifting them up and helping them in their situations. What would have been the situation of selling your daughter into this form of servitude? Well, it wouldn't have been ideal. We we're going to start with that. It's never God's ideal. It would have been the most extreme, hard cases. If I have a daughter, and I am a landless peasant, and I cannot feed her, and I cannot feed myself, then I may, instead of receiving the bride's price from a potential groom, remember, before the Industrial Revolution, it's all hands on deck. Everybody's working all day long. Some of us, maybe you grew up on a farm. You remember, that's what you did. Everybody was working, and everybody was working all day long. Well, in order to reimburse a family for the loss of a bride going out of a family to be adopted into the male's family, it was typical that the man would pay a two-year salary to the family to be held in escrow by the father of the bride, similar to an insurance policy. If the husband should die, if the divorce should happen, or he should leave, two years is basically being held in escrow by the father. Now, let's say I'm a father and I can't feed my daughter. It's less than an ideal situation. But here is a landowner, a cattle rancher, a sheep herder. He's got lots who can provide for my daughter. Instead of receiving the two-year salary from a potential bridegroom, what I've done is I have instead received that same money from a landowner. Well, now he is owed that debt. Instead of the father being owed that debt, now the master of this landowner is owed that debt for this girl. And he's going to act as the guardian of this girl. Again, this is far from ideal. If you ever want to know what God's ideal is, just go back to the garden. You have King Adam, you have Queen Eve, and you have no slaves. That's always God's ideal, and it's always a safe place to start to discern what is God's best desire for society. Further, this would not have been lifelong servitude. 
She's at least going to graduate out of this by age of 20. That's the uh, maximum age of a Hebrew adult. Or she's going to work off that two years um, salary that the master had given to her. It's reckoned by commentators, again, that 20 years old, she's going to um, age out of this. Also, I want you to notice there are several stipulations that do not apply to a male servant. Now, let's say I'm a male servant, and I'm broke, because that's why I would become a Hebrew servant. Hebrew slavery has almost nothing to do with the slavery that we are familiar with in the Confederate States. Almost nothing to do. If I'm a peasant, I can't feed myself, it's actually in my best interest to willingly attach myself to a rich landowner who has a lot of cattle or farm so that I can feed myself. Now, if I come in with a 30 shekel debt, let's say, and I've worked off 15 shekels, well, I've still got 15 shekels of debt left on my head. He, let's say he's ready to retire. Let's say he's ready to move to a new town. He can sell that 50 shekel debt that's still on my head to somebody else. Now I have to go work for somebody else until I've worked that 15 shekels off. Because the Bible teaches that you have to repay the debts that you willingly take upon yourself. Does that make sense? Okay. However, different rules apply for the female. And I want you to see that God is always in the business of protecting the females in the culture. God says, now, if you have this less than ideal situation, if you're a father, you can't feed your daughter, and you have to put her in this situation, like we heard today. If you have a child that you can't feed, you have to put the child in an orphanage. It's less than ideal, but it keeps the child alive. If you put the child, the daughter, in this situation, she cannot be resold. If somehow she doesn't please the master, or she shows up, won't work, or is not working out the situation, there has to be a refund. Okay? She can go back to her father. Now, the father has to refund the money, obviously. But she's able to be refunded back to her original family. She's certainly not to be sold into a foreign slave situation because that would be taking her out from under the legal protection of those who had the word of God. At this time in history, only little Israel had the infallible word of God. It understood that the fear of God is what's going to keep a nation from abusing women. You get that? We're living in a culture It's not sure how to talk to women, not sure how to talk about women, not sure how to treat women, and we argue about it. First of all, this is what drives me bananas. I don't know if you notice this or it drives you bananas. First of all, we're told in the media, men and women are exactly the same. And then the media says, but you see how that man treated women differently. Are they different or are they the same? As a Christian, I have answers for all these things. I have answers because I have the Word of God. God says women are to be given special protection under God's law. And you remove the fear of God out of a culture, you're going to remove the good treatment of women out of that culture. And the solution is not to browbeat men into being passive, because that's the culture's solution, by the way. The culture's solution is we're going to take the masculinity out from men and then they'll treat women right. Wrong! We need to put the masculinity back in the man and teach the fear of God to the men and then they'll treat the women right. If a girl is to be a bride for the master's son, she's going to be elevated to the status of daughter. Because what's essentially happening, let's say... I want to marry the redhead, okay? Well, I can't afford the redhead, but my father can, which was probably true at the time. <laughs> the father can afford the two years' salary, so he pays the bride price. She comes into the house. She's a redhead, so of course I'm going to be attracted to her. And so he gives her to me as my bride. So what's essentially happened? Essentially, the father has paid the bride price instead of the son. It's kind of like buying the first car. Who really buys the first car? Well, probably the father. That's not an exact comparison. I I'm working the sermon out as I go. But you get the point. The father has paid the bride's price. Now she's not going to be considered a servant. She has automatically been elevated to the status of daughter. And 
should the bridegroom become a polygamist, which is never God's design, never God's ideal. He may not reduce the wife's food, clothing, or marital rights. Now, marital rights refers to her right to bear children. That was seen as her covenant responsibility. Otherwise, she's free to go at no cost. Now, what's the typical understanding of debt that you take on? The typical understanding, if you choose to take on debt, you have to pay back the debt. Well, the girl essentially has taken on debt in the sense that her father has been paid the bride's parts. But, if the man becomes a polygamist and chooses to treat her poorly, she's free to go and the debt is forgiven. The debt is counseled. Okay? This is one of the many examples where we're going to see there are things in God's law that are laws to limit abuse. That does not condone the thing itself. God says, yes, you can become a servant. Is, is servitude God's best? Absolutely not. God's best is that every man should have his own fig tree and his own vine, be his own independent man, be able to work with his hands and earn a living for his family. That's God's best. But we live in a fallen world. We live in a world filled with sin and, and thorns and thistles and death. And so God says, you can become a servant. But God gives laws protecting these things. God has laws limiting the abuses of polygamy. Polygamy is not God's best. It's not God's ideal. It was not God's design. And again, how do I know this? Because when I open the first pages of my scripture, God made Adam and he brought him a wife. Singular. God has created women, typically, more naturally timid and thus poor negotiators for their own well-being and position. And therefore, it is incumbent upon the fathers during the first stage of their life and the husband in the latter stage of their life to be a voice for them, to protect them, all the while allowing them to keep their softness and their femininity. The, here's, here's the solution that the culture that we live in is telling us. The solution for the disparities that they begrudgingly, backwardly kind of admit that exist between men and women is men, you need to stop being masculine. Naughty, naughty you. You need to stop that. And the scripture's response is absolutely not. I need to speak up for the women in my life. I need to be the voice for the women in my life. I need to put a protective care over them. This is what we learn out of God's law. And I would ask you to consider what has happened in our own culture where such laws would be considered, oddly, anti-women. What has happened is the culture has removed the masculine protection of the women. And my question is this. Has that made women more free or just more angry? Has it made them more liberated or has it just made them more masculine? You see, men, when we bow and become passive, when we give up our masculinity, it doesn't feel right. But when the culture beats on us and beats on us and beats on us to lose our masculinity and to not give protective care and be the voice of for our women, our wives, our daughters, what happens is, you know what the wife, the daughters say? If he's not going to be my voice, I've got to be my voice. And I've got to be aggressive, and I've got to take on this odd masculinity that doesn't feel right, and it doesn't look right. Rules Against Mistreatment, verses 26 through and 27 in the same chapter. When a man strikes the eye of his slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall let the slave go free because of his eye. If he knocks out his tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of his tooth. This demonstrates that Hebrew slavery did not extend towards abuse, certainly not lasting abuse. Now, there could have been corporal punishment. Now, we've talked about already the two reasons that you could have become a Hebrew servant. One. I willingly choose to take on debt. i got to pay back that debt. And if it means through force, through corporal punishment, 
I got to pay back that debt. I could be, they could whip them, but they could not lastingly injure them. Or perhaps you're a thief. You got to pay back your restitution. You got to pay back the fine that which you stole. If you choose to be a thief, you got to pay back that fine. Now, if you can, if you don't have capital in your pocket, if you don't have capital in your herds, at least you got potential capital in your hands, and you've got to surrender the capital of your hands to now that man who's going to be your master, until which time has you've worked it all. Well, if you refuse to work it all, you're not paying back your fine. You feel, you, you see in this? And so you could be forced, but not lastingly injured. Now, the complaint might come from, again, the modern reader, well, isn't there disparity in the Word of God? Because what we're used to is eye for eye and tooth for tooth. And I don't take that literal as much as that the punishment should fit the crime. If you do a tooth's worth of crime, you get a tooth's worth of punishment and so forth. Is there not inequity? Well, let's first remind ourselves why the person is in bondage to begin with. Either is willingly taken on the debt or is a criminal paying off restitution. Either way... He, the master is losing. If the master loses his temper, let's say he knocks his tooth out, and let's say there's 30 shekels of silver still owed on this man's either debt or restitution coming to me, well, I've just forfeited that money. Okay, I have forfeited my 30 shekels of silver because of my one moment of rage that I let out on this person. Particularly in the case of a criminal. A criminal, if he's a criminal in this case, he might be prone to violence. Nevertheless, God says, even those who are criminals deserve to be treated with kindness. Even those with criminal backgrounds ought to be treated with the decency of a human being who has created in the image of God because you know what? God doesn't quit on people. God has better days ahead, despite what their past may be. All men are made in the image of God. They're worthy of respect. Unlimited authority in the case of a master, even if it's over a criminal who's paying back fines that he stole from this person, even in that situation, if you give someone unlimited authority, it's too much to have over another individual. When authority is unlimited and punishment is allowed to be excessive, you know what that does? It creates more anger out of the criminal. And here's what we're doing in our country. We have excessive punishment in that the criminal is not having, being able to save face in paying back that which he stole. He is being abused, often not by the state, but often by other criminals in the incarcerated state that he's in. He's becoming more angry, and then you know what we do? We say, now that we've got you maximally angry, now that we have abused you in a culture of prison that is maximally angry, now we're going to let you back out into society. Won't that render a greater threat to society? Abusing a man to the point that his dignity is robbed is never God's way. And even for the pragmatist, who does not believe God showed up at Sinai, does not believe God showed up at Bethlehem, even for the pragmatist, they ought to be able to see that if you mistreat a human being long enough, all you're going to do is make them angry, release them back into the culture. And what are they going to do? Why are we surprised that they create more and more havoc where they go? Further, God still desires for the criminal to go out and make good, to seek his own dominion. Now, if he doesn't have use of his eye, if he doesn't have use of his limbs, his, he's lame now, he can't make dominion. He can't have dominion. He can't make a living for his family. Thus, God does not wish a man to be made blind or lame. Let's also consider the issue of jubilee. When we read in the culture that, remember last week we talked about after six years maximum you go free. Now, that dealt with poor loans. That's not business loans, and it's certainly not criminal restitution. It is theoretically possible that you stole enough that you were going to be in servitude the rest of your life. That's theoretically possible. So the six years dealt with more poor loans. But even in the case of discussing slavery, it was not to be a growing institution because of this, because of the year of Jubilee. 
you shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years shall go forty-nine years. Then shall be the sound of the loud trumpet in the tenth day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. You shall sound the trumpet throughout your land, and you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return the property and each shall return to his clan. So when I buy land in a Hebrew culture, what I'm really doing is I am leasing the land on a prorated basis. Let's say there's 30 years to the year of Jubilee. Well, I'm going to pay a 30-year prorated valuation basis on that land. I can get 30 years of crops. I can graze my cattle for 30 years. So I'm going to pay you based on that 30-year time limit. Well, at the end of 30 years, my lease is up and the land goes back to the original owner. You know why? Because God does not want there to be a landless peasant class in the culture. If, if you live in an agricultural economy and you don't have any land, what's going to become of you? Right? You're going to be a peasant. And your children and your grandchildren are going to be peasants because you had to sell your land way back long ago. Well, now that land is going to revert back to the original owners. Now, guess what? I got a lot of slaves, let's say, and I don't have a lot of land. What's going to happen to those slaves? They are going to become a detriment on my books. If I got a lot of slaves and I don't have a lot of land, you know what I'm going to do to those slaves? I'm going to say, see ya. Have a nice day. Go back home. You're free because if I got slaves with no land to farm and no land to graze cattle, they're actually a detriment on my books, and they get to go free. You see what God is doing? God says, yes, you got to pay back what you own. Yes, you got to pay back that which you stole. Yes, these are things that you have to take on responsibility because of the things you did. You either took on a loan or you became a thief. That being said, God has built a trip level into the economics of the culture that every 50th year, it made no sense to have large slave holdings. In fact, having large slave holdings was actually a sign that God was blessing the slaves. This comes to us from early Exodus. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And so when you see growing slave populations, it's actually a sign that God is blessing the slaves. Jubilee, therefore, would have been at least an incentive to send foreign slaves back. Now, here's what's happening. God has built in evangelical things in the culture. When you had a slave and you let them go, when they were treated with respect, they were treated with dignity, they were provided for, and then they were let go at no cost. You don't think that would have an evangelical effect on the cultures at large? The system of holding foreign slaves has come to an end through the liberation of Jesus Christ in Luke. Jesus went to the synagogue. He was given a scroll and he opened to Isaiah 61. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus' very first sermon was to proclaim that this system of holding foreign slaves, which was allowed for a brief time in Israel's history and was really the exception and not the rule, Jesus said that system is now over. Jesus says, I am inaugurating a time of good news of the gospel where there is not going to be this bondage. Admittedly, foreign slaves were held... Again, it's the exception, but we have to admit it and we have to deal with it because what's my premise? My premise is there is nothing in this Bible commanded or prohibited by God that ought to embarrass me. Is that right? There's nothing in this Bible commanded or prohibited by God that ought to embarrass me. So when God says that back then a man could sell his daughter into slavery, the modern reader, the modern reader says, ha ha, see? See how unethical your God is? But once we understand it, 
once we understand it, he was impoverished, she's starving, it's temporary, she's treated well, she's not treated well, she gets to go back. We understand it a bit better. Here's another one. We can't be embarrassed by this, and we're going to explain why. This, then Solomon counted all the resident aliens who were in the land of Israel, after the census of them that David, his father, had taken. And there were found 153,600. 70,000 of them were assigned to bear burdens, 80,000 to the quarry in the hill country, 3,600 as overseas to make the people work. Okay? So there were foreign slaves, at least we know at Solomon's time. So why should God allow such? Well, remember, again, we're not going to be embarrassed by anything. What God's plan is this. After 10 generations of being removed from your original culture, you came out from under the curse that you had been under when you were an idolater. When you're an idolater and you came into Hebrew culture, you're not immediately trusted or given the same status as a Hebrew worshiper would have been. Ten generations later you are. What God is doing is he is taking them out from the demonic, idolatrous forces of their former pagan backgrounds and he is moving them to the true worship of the true God. Now, even amidst all this discussion, let's remind ourselves, even in this, slavery has more to do with man's sinfulness than it ever has to do with God's ideal. Even in the discussion of taking people out from under demonic forces and forcing them to work for the Hebrews, even in that discussion, we have to admit that this was not God's ideal. Servitude exists because sin exists. And servitude is allowed within the historical framework pointing towards eternal tor torture. This is why the culture you and I live in cannot accept the fact that there is to be servitude. If I willingly take on a loan, I've got to pay back that loan. If I steal, I've got to pay back plus a fine on top of that which I steal. That's God's way. The culture says this is oppressive. Because the culture doesn't like the thing, the spiritual thing that these earthly things point to, which is eternal hellfire. The culture hates the doctrine of hell. And therefore, the culture hates the things that God has put into the culture that point to eternal hellfire. When you become a servant to a master and he's brutalizing you and he's tyrannical to you, that's terrible but at least points to the eternal tortures that God has in store for those who never bow the knee to Jesus Christ. I'll give you an example where submission actually benefited someone. It's related to Rehoboam and the invasion of Egypt into southern Judah. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. He took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away the shields of gold Solomon made. Now notice the reaction. And when Rehoboam humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him so as to not make complete destruction. Moreover, conditions were good in Judah. Okay? Was this forced submission pleasant? Absolutely not. Forced submission is not pleasant. Whether it's forced submission of I took on a loan and now I've got to pay it back, or whether I've been a criminal and now I've got to pay it back, or whether it's Rehoboam, who, by the way, is better remembered for his impertinence than anything else. Even Rehoboam learned submission through the hardship of being submitted to another master. Okay? Sometimes, in order to get our attention, God has to lay us low. He may have to lay you low financially. He may have to low, lay low our nation financially to get our attention. And we say, well, we don't want that. We don't want to be debtor nation. We don't want to be slaves to anyone. We don't want all of our revenue going out of the country. And we don't want those things. But you know what? If God humbles us, if God finally, 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 breaks our hard heart, it'll be worth it. I don't want to be. But if that's what it 
case. Then it'll be worth it. Finally, spiritual implications. Now, I've covered a lot of topics under this topic of slavery. I've covered a lot of material. But there is one type of slavery that's particularly abusive, and it's likened unto the Egyptian bondage that was intended to go on forever and ever, and that is the spiritual condition of those who wind up cast out of God's presence in the place called hell. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. You know, just like God had to step into those Hebrews' situation and free them with a mighty hand out of Egypt, that's how bound you and I were to sin. You had no more chance to free yourself from the slavery of sin than those Hebrews did to walk away from the most powerful nation on earth at the day and march through the Red Sea on dry ground. You had no more chance than that. And yet, look what God has done. God says, I have seen the slavery of my people. And when people are in sin, they're in slavery. And God reaches down and He pulls us out of that. And you have to, at some point, you have to say to yourself, I'm tired of being under this tire. I'm tired of being a slave to sin, where the only reward thereof is shame and sorrow and terror and misery. I'm tired of it. And my friend, if you're tired of serving a master that pays you shame, sorrow, and misery, i got a, I got a much better master to recommend. Jesus Christ. He never abuses you. Now he's the master. And he demands service. There's no way around it. He says pick up your cross and follow me. But he's kind. And he's good. And he's gentle. And he makes us free. And when Christ comes to live in you, you know what? Those things that used to captivate your mind and captivate your attention and make you chase after all that sparkles and shines in this world it becomes nothing. And the righteousness of Christ becomes your delight. Isn't that good news? Yes, Isn't it good? Isn't it good that there's nothing in this Bible that ought to embarrass you? Isn't it good that when we rightly understand God's Word, we can take these lessons to a culture that says, men, you better not be masculine. Ladies, you better start being masculine. And we can say, forget. Men, be that protective covering over your women. Be kind to them, but be strong for them. Be the voice for them. The reward will be they will be soft and beautiful. Let's pray together. Father, we delight for the differences that you have created in each of us. And that each of us have our own particular roles and strengths and weaknesses. And together, Lord, we all build up in the unity of Christ. Lord, I pray for husbands out there that are struggling with being a voice for the women. And for the ladies, Lord, who are struggling in a culture that lies to them all day long. Father God, we do pray that you would raise up such men and women that would honor you with all their lives and bring glory to you in Jesus' name. Stand for God's blessing. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, he will also do it. Amen. Mm -hmm.